If you haven't figured it out already, there is a crap load of Dragon Age lore. And within that lore, there are a lot of organizations, including this new one popping up all over the place, called the Inquisition. But you've also got the Seekers of Truth, the Chantry, the Templar Order, the Circle of Magi, the Grey Wardens, the Kunari, and who the hell are all these people? It can be hard to keep track of all of them and how they relate to each other, so I put together a little history on the Inquisition, the Seekers of Truth, and all these other organizations, and how they relate to each other and their potential roles in the game. To fully understand the Inquisition, you have to go way back in Dragon Age lore, to the days just after the First Blight. The Maker's chosen prophet, Andraste, had just succeeded in shattering the tyranny of the Tevinter Imperium, a slave city run by power-drunk mages, with her crusade known as the Exalted March, which culminated in her eventual martyrdom. The first Inquisitors were basically pissed-off Andraste loyalists that began an upstart group, completely unaffiliated with the Chantry, which is a common misconception, who set out to seek justice on the scattered but still widespread tyrannous blood mages and cultists. Their integrity is somewhat questioned in the history books of Thetis, as evidenced by this codex from 2 that says, The Inquisition once hunted heretics and cultists as well as mages, and the reign of terror ended only with the inception of the Circle of Magi. However, whether or not they were a terrorist organization is left up to interpretation, as it is suggested that the Chantry purposefully cast them in a negative light due to the fact that they helped mages and ordinary people alike. The timeline here puts that initial formation of the Inquisition at around negative 100 Ancient, 100 years before the formation of the Chantry, only much later on in the year 120 Divine, 20 years after the Chantry's formation and when the Chantry began to keep track of time in centuries, each given their own name based on the circumstances of that time, did they decide their interests coincide with that of the Chantry's. The Chantry and Inquisition signed what was called the Navarin Accord, and the Inquisition was folded into the Chantry, and split into two groups that have lasted throughout the ages, the Templar Order and the Seekers of Truth. Also created as part of the Navarin Accord was the Circle of Magi, that all-too-familiar organization that serves as a prison for mages under the guise of a school that teaches proper use of magic. Most of you are also probably familiar with the Templars already. Their function is to train against and control mages, locking them in towers for their entire lives, ensuring they do not commune with spirits of the Fade and become abominations, and hunting down any mages not imprisoned in the Circle, known as apostates. The Seekers of Truth, however, are a much less known group, initially made up of the most senior members of the First Inquisition. They've faded more into the background of history, but have remained ever-present. Their role, as created by the Navarin Accord, is to oversee the actions of the Templars. The Codex on the Seekers from Dragon Age 2 says this about them. They serve the Divine, and they are feared. When a Seeker steps from the shadows, Templars run for cover, because why would he come unless the Templars somehow failed in their duties? Seekers are extremely effective investigating abuses within the Circle and hunting particularly evasive apostates. This is particularly interesting, because the Seekers can intervene on behalf of the Templars or the Mages, whoever has stepped out of line. Clearly, the events in Kirkwall called for the Seeker's intervention, which is what led to Cassandra Pentagast's aggressive interrogation of Varric in 2. Whose fault the demolition of the Chantry was is up for interpretation here. Were the Templars too aggressive or too lax in their duties? This is what the Seekers will be concerned with discovering. The truth is that both sides are partially to blame, and with all the events that have rocked Thetis in the Dragon Age thus far, the Seeker's narrow-minded obsession with assigning blame for the Kirkwall incident will leave them ill-equipped to deal with the big picture. And so, with the world teetering on the brink of chaos once again, a second Inquisition is beginning, led by the main character of the third game, who you as the player will control. As it was in the past, this new Inquisition is a completely independent body, beholden to no higher authority, and is not affiliated with the Chantry. Once again, another common misconception, especially due to the fact that one of your confirmed party members is or was a Seeker of Truth, and is none other than Cassandra Pentagast, that bitch that threw a book at Varric. It's safe to say the established powers that be will have a problem with this newly reformed group seizing so much power, and much like the quests and Origins, you'll have to work to garner support for the group, and force or convince others to respect you and the Inquisition's authority. It has a very similar feel to the Order of the Grey Wardens, in fact, in the sense that, for those who believe in it, there is no higher calling. This can be seen by some of the members of your party. Cassandra Pentagast, first of all, presumably leaves the Seekers of Truth, and instead chooses the much more risky and dangerous road of the Inquisition. In addition, Another confirmed party member named Vivian is an extremely powerful and prominent Orlesian mage, 
who is in line to become the first enchanter, but instead forfeits that position to assist the Inquisition. There have been several things culminating that this new Inquisition will be concerned with investigating. First, the most obvious, is the impending war between the Circle of Magi and the Templars. I suspect that the Inquisitor will be given choices in line with either backing up the Templars' extreme means for controlling the mages and calling for even more brutal laws against them, or to attempt to force the Templars to back down and grant mages more freedom. Perhaps the impending conflict can either be exacerbated by the Inquisitor, or even entirely avoided depending on your choices. The next most obvious concern of the Inquisition is the mystery surrounding the all-powerful Flemeth and her involvement in nearly all of the events that have put Thetis in this dire state. Is she responsible for the Terror in the Veil? What were her motives for assisting both the Warden and the Champion? Hand in hand with the Flemeth storyline is Morrigan's potential involvement. This gets a little bit tricky as Morrigan can have an extremely significant impact in the events of Origins based on your choices. Or if you were so inclined, you could have just told her to take a hike. You were both fools. It'll be interesting to see what her resurgence pretends for players who minimized her involvement. For players who were more involved with Morrigan, especially in the romantic sense, a wise decision. Her return could mean some Come very right interesting new developments, like her archdemon baby, or even a reappearance of your warden character. Getting down to some more deeply buried conflict also brewing is the impending war between the Kunari and the Tevinter Imperium. This storyline is mostly developed in the new Dark Horse Dragon Age comic, and poses some very interesting plot twists, including the introduction of the newly appointed Airshock, none other than Sten himself. While the Tevinter Imperium is often talked about in a historical sense, it is very much still alive, and perhaps attempting to seize some of the power they lost after their glory days ended with the Exalted March. They could certainly re-enter the world as a major player again, due to the fact that the Veil Tear connects mages to the Fade even more bolstering their already extreme abilities. In addition, the mages of Thetis have fallen victim to many grave injustices since the rule of the Chantry, and the Imperium could find more potential allies in Orlea and Ferelden than they ever thought possible. All I'm saying is, go to a man who's been persecuted and locked in a tower his entire life and offer him a chance to be a king, it's not so hard to see the Imperium making a glorious return. There's also the question of Alistair's potential involvement due to his quest to find out the truth about his father in the Aurelian Titus storyline, also developed in the new Dark Horse comics, and the power of the Blood Mages insist resides within his blood. So, if you're wondering whether or not all these different groups are actually going to come into play, or if I'm just making this all up as I go, do you remember this cool new art of the Inquisitor? Well, if you zoom in to take a look at the different rings on his fingers, what do you see? From left to right, we first see the symbol of the Seekers of Truth. Skipping the second one for now, the third ring bears the symbol of the Circle of Magi. Lastly, the ring on the far right bears the symbol of the Templar Order. To me, the appearance of these symbols does not, and could not for that matter, mean that the Inquisitor belongs to all of these groups, or even supports one or the other. I believe it is symbolic of the forces that are of importance to the Inquisitor, and are also quite possibly indicative of allies from each group. We already know Cassandra, a former Seeker, and Vivian, a former Mage of the Circle, join you in your quest. Perhaps we'll be receiving a former Templar as an ally as well, forming a rainbow coalition of peace, or a boiling cauldron of explosiveness. The second ring as of now is still a mystery, but its glowing light brings a few things to mind. First, it could potentially be made of lyrium, and we've seen what that crap can do. It could also be indicative of a special power possessed by only the Inquisitor, or that it is a type of Deus Ex Machina artifact whose importance will be discovered. Or maybe it's just a cool glowy ring for effect. Who knows? In any event, thanks for taking this look through Dragon Age lore and history with me. If you found it fun and informative, or at least bearable, throw me a sub! And if you have any other Dragon Age lore you have questions about or would like me to discuss, hit me up in the comments. Until next time, may the Maker watch over you.